You are listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 83. Hit it. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. It's coming to an end. Graduation is barreling down hard and fast. The reality of the next stage for your child is a sobering thought. Your child will be living alone for the first time. You can't help but wonder, is she ready? Is she equipped to make decisions, the right decisions? Did you do enough to prepare her? Does she know how to do her laundry, make a meal? Oh, wait, maybe she does. Mm, but maybe she doesn't. She didn't get tons of time in the kitchen. We were all so busy all the time. I wanted to teach her how to make our favorite dishes, what to make for her first date, how to bake cookies for her friends. Shoot, I meant to do all of this. If this is you, don't go too far down the guilty rabbit hole. Katie Morford is here to save the day with her brand new cookbook, Prep, The Essential College Cookbook. So if you've got a graduate or somebody in your family you want to teach how to cook, you'll want to listen in on this show. And let me give you a little hint. This book is an awesome graduation gift. You can find the show notes and all the links that we discuss over at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 083. That is 083 for episode number 83. But before we dive in, I just want to remind you, if you're interested in learning about protein, I recently did a protein series interviewing three different researchers on three different topics related to protein. The episodes are number 80, number 81, and number 82. Episode number 80 is with Heather Lighty, a researcher on protein in teens and how it influences their weight status, their appetite. And really, we talk very practically about how to get more protein into the breakfast meal and also how that looks for teens and kids for the rest of their day. In episode number 81, I interviewed Dr. Stefan Van Fleet, and we talked about whole foods versus supplements. And he really gets into how the whole food item has so much more than just protein and why it's so much more to be focused on whole foods over just supplementing with protein. And then lastly, I talked with Dr. Stuart Phillips in episode number 82, and we talked about the use of protein supplements and whether those are safe for young athletes. And he has a lot of good advice to give in that episode. And I especially know if you're a parent of an athlete, you're probably hearing the question, about using protein supplements and or thinking about it or even maybe worrying about it. So this episode will definitely set the record straight for you and give you some really good uh, tips and strategies for managing the topic of protein supplementation in athletes. Next on The Nourished Child is guest Maureen Healy. She is the author of The Emotionally Healthy Child. So she will guide us through what it means to be emotionally healthy as a child and help us as parents focus on the emotional health of our child, which I think is a really important topic. Uh, It's probably always been an important topic, but I think in today's world, with all the stress that uh, we all are living under, including our children, it's really important to get a handle on the emotional health of our kids. So that's what's coming up. But now I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Katie Morford. She's a food and nutrition writer who lives and works in San Francisco with her husband and three daughters. She's the author of three cookbooks, and she has been on this show before. Um, Her three cookbooks are Prep, Rise and Shine, which is a breakfast cookbook, and Best Lunchbox Ever, which obviously is a lunch cookbook. Her first love is cooking, a craft that is informed by her background as a registered dietitian with a master's degree in nutrition. A longtime freelance writer, Katie's recipes, articles, and tips have appeared nearly everywhere, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, 
Family Circle, Oprah, Cooking Light, Real Simple, and Parenting, and many others. She is the author of the popular blog, Mom's Kitchen Handbook. So if you're not familiar with that, go check it out. I'll include the links in the show notes for all of her cookbooks and her blog site. But without further ado, let's dig into this interview. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast. Thank you. Glad to have you on again. I can't believe this is cookbook number three. I know. I in what, five years or something? Six years? Um, I think six. My first book came out in 2013. Same year as Fearless Feeding, actually. Yeah. So I feel like we've been on a, a similar yeah. trajectory in terms of book writing and stuff. Definitely. So tell us about your first two and how you came to write about prep. So my first book is called Best Lunchbox Ever. And it's really like a handbook, guidebook, cookbook for packing healthy school lunches that certainly has lots of recipes and ideas that are applicable for adults as well. Mm -hmm. My second book is kind of similar concept for breakfast. So it's uh, Rise and Shine, Better Breakfast for Busy Mornings. And it's how to tackle those busy weekday mornings and get, and, you know, everyone says that they love breakfast. It's a tricky time of the day. And these are all sort of strategies and tips and lots of recipes on making a delicious, nourishing breakfast. Yes. And I had you on the show for Rise and Shine. And that was back early in the days of the podcast releasing. I'm just looking up what number it was for anybody else who might want to go back and listen to it. It was number 19. Woo! <laughs> you feel fast. Uh, I have a little chart here. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, prep is, ta let's talk about prep, how you came to writing this book. I know part of it is, um, you know, I've reviewed the book and part of it is just a natural sort of evolution of here you are with grown kids who are ready to launch the nest and you become so aware of of what they have and what they need and, and then what other people need. So it's interesting. I feel like all of my books mirror kind of where I've been as a parent in that particular stage of life. And prep is something that came about when my oldest daughter was approaching her high school graduation. I was going into that panic phase that I think a lot of parents go through when they think about like, have I prepared my child to mm -hmm. be out in the world and thinking about all those practical life skills that we want our kids to have. And it made me think a lot about from a cooking standpoint, what are those key skills that that I want my kids to have um, as they, you know, go into their first kitchen. And, and so that was really the springboard for writing prep. I had the same, you know, I had the same thoughts when my kids started to launch also, you know, you, you sort of go through motherhood with younger children and you're exposing them to things in the kitchen, getting them involved. And I feel like I, you know, I feel like I did a really good job of that. I'm sure you have done a good job of that as well. But you still hit that panic mode at the end. It's yeah. like, oh my gosh, can they care for themselves? Yeah. Do they know how to eat healthy? I right, think they do. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> you know, I I believe, and I think you do too, that all children should learn how to cook. What what do you think, you know, in your opinion, and I know you cover this a little bit in the book, the reasons why it's important for children to learn how to cook? There are so many good reasons. I, and I think of it as a very important life skill. It's very up there for me at the top of the list of those life skills. From a really practical standpoint, you know, you think about a young person, you know, in their first apartment without much budget, it's cheaper to cook homemade food than it is to, to eat out all the time, unless you're eating really, you know, not very good, healthy food, if you're eating at a fast food restaurant all the time. So I think the affordability factor is big, certainly a help from a health standpoint, um, eating homemade food tends to have less sugar and fewer calories and less unhealthy fats, you know, more fruits and vegetables, all that kind of good stuff. I think for this generation in particular, who tend to be you know, especially concerned about the environment. I think eating homemade food has, you know, a lighter footprint on the planet because you don't have all those takeout boxes. There tends to be less food waste. Um, when we eat out, there tends to be giant portions. We can't always finish them. So, you know, that plays a role. 
And then I think it's just fun and creative and knowing how to cook is a great way to be with your friends. Mm -hmm. So those are sort of at the top of my list for most compelling reasons. Yeah. And I take it yours, your daughter who's in college now can cook. Does she? she? Yes, she can. Yeah. And does she cook for herself regularly or is she? She does. She does. So this is the first year that she's had her own apartment um, and she's been having a great time cooking both just for herself and for her roommates. Um, She really didn't like eating the cafeteria food. And currently she's actually studying abroad, living in a house with like, I don't know, 12 kids and she's making these, you know, ginormous meals for everyone and just having a ball with it. Sounds like she's following in her mother's <laughs> footsteps. I'm, it's very <laughs> satisfying, I have to say. Well, I have to ask, you know, my, my girls cook too, and uh, they send me shots of what they've cooked quite regularly. Do you? Does yeah, yours also? I do. I do get that. <laughs> um, or she'll call and tell me, you know, her menu or... She just, I mean, this like put me over the moon. She actually used one of my recipes from my blog. And I just thought that was really sweet. That is so cute. Well, you have a fabulous blog and I use many of your recipes as well. And I noticed that there were a couple of them in the prep book. I was looking at the French omelet and I'm like, I learned how to make a French omelet from Katie. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. So when you think about this book in terms of the age target, who mm-hmm. who would you recommend uh, the cookbook for? Well, I really wrote it with my own kids' ages in mind, and they were actually really involved in me, you know, how I decided to put this together. So I really think of it as a book for teenagers, you know, high school students and college students. But the recipes are would certainly be appealing and are simple enough that I could see a younger child uh, using them maybe with a little extra supervision on things, you know, when you're dealing with heat and knives and, and definitely a young adult in a first apartment. I mean, it's it's really a starter cookbook is what it is. Oh, that's great. Starter cookbook. That's mm-hmm. awesome. I know I looked in there and I was like, oh, fried rice. My son started making that when he was probably 10 or 11. That's- Scrambled mm-hmm. eggs, same thing. And, yeah. and so it struck me as a book that you know, maybe even middle schoolers could use yeah, when definitely. they're just starting out. Definitely. Yeah. So how did you decide on the recipes that you included in the book? Well, I was really clear from the outset that I was going to tackle sort of what I thought of as 10 essentials, you know, 10 essential skills. So for example, there's a chapter called prep eggs like a pro, fix a killer plate of pasta, make grains, you know, these, you know, there's a vegetable chapter. So that was sort of the framework. And then I, I wanted it to not be overwhelming. So I just chose a very curated list of five recipes per chapter. So you look at the pasta chapter, and there's just five recipes. And I feel like with the idea that something in here is going to appeal to everybody. And a lot of these are are things that I have fed my kids over time that are just reliable and delicious. And I also consulted my kids. Um, They were the ones that said, absolutely, do not put a deviled egg recipe in this book. That's just (laughs) weird, mom. Oh, that's Um, funny. And there's, you know, there's a lot of really wholesome recipes. There's vegetables and salads, but there's fun things in here. There's, you know, there's a recipe for nachos and there's cupcakes. And so it's a real kind of balance of all of that. It struck me as tailored a lot to what kids that age like to eat, uh, but with a healthier spin on it. Yeah, that was really my intention. When you think about, you know, where kids and teens and adults are spending their time, young adults, a lot Mm -hmm. of them are spending time online Mm -hmm. um, on their mobile phones. Why did you choose to do a physical book over maybe an app or, and maybe that's something you're rolling out after this, I don't know, but why physical, like a hold, hold in your hand book versus something online? Um, I really wanted it to be sort of like a one piece, one stop shopping for cooking basics. And there's a whole upfront section of this book that I think is really important if you're starting off, um, that just wouldn't be part of so much a part of an online package, right? So there's photographs on how to hold a knife and how to chop an onion, you know, what kinds of things you might want to have in your kitchen and what are some of the basic tools So I really wanted that to be part of the whole package. And I I felt like a handheld book just 
was going to be the way to do that. You know, when I see my kids in the kitchen and I ask them what they're cooking and they'll tell me, oh, I just found this recipe for, you know, whatever, almond meal brownies or something online. And I always sort of hold my breath because I feel like there's so many unreliable recipes online. Anyone mm-hmm. can start a blog. And and that bums me out because if you're a starter cook and you don't have a lot of experience and you put the time and the you know money into making something and it fails, your natural, uh, I think, response is going to feel like it was your fault. And I think there's a lot of just bad recipes out there. So I'm That's- just a big believer in super reliable recipes that are really well tested. Every recipe in this book was tested by a teenager or a college age kid. So that's just sort of Good like a little aside. I think that's a really important point. And what comes to mind is, uh, do you remember like f- maybe four or five years ago, uh, there was just this whole social media love of posting Pinterest fails mm-hmm. recipe yes. that yeah. just did not work out like yeah. and did not look like what the picture showed. And yeah, I think that that's, um, I hadn't thought about that in terms of online recipes, mm-hmm. but I think that's a really good point because there are a plethora of them, mm-hmm. but you're right. They probably are made once mm-hmm. and perhaps not really tested and measured and you know, success tested, I guess. Right. And also written, you know, you know, with a beginner in mind. Yeah. And so in your book, you go through how to chop an onion, Mm -hmm. how to chop garlic. Uh, You talk about the different terminology that somebody might need, a a young person would need to know in terms of cooking. So you do really get into some of the basics. What are some of the other basics that, you know, sort of are essential for, for new cooks? I mean, this is more sort of philosophical than practical, but I think recognizing that you're a beginner and like taking on any new skill, it's going to take time. So be a little bit patient with yourself. Recognize that even someone who's experienced in skills has failures. I mean, I'm a cookbook author, food writer. I have failures in the kitchen. So I think a little bit of patience starting with something simple and building from there. And then in terms of the practical stuff, I can't understate how important just basic knife skills are, having you know one good knife and learning how to use it. And I talk about how to use a knife in the book. And then the other wonderful thing about online is you can get on YouTube and see like how to chop an onion or how to uh, mm-hmm. hold a knife and all that kind of stuff. So those are that's sort of what I think of. I love networking. I'm part of a podcast network called Parents on Demand, or the Pod Network. We are a network of fun and educational podcasts perfect for your family. You can explore the shows in the network by going to parentsondemand.com and searching specific categories. Parents on Demand also has a download for a free network app on iOS and Android, so you can listen to your favorite shows or find new podcasts. Subscribe through iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, or another provider. Every month, I will feature a podcast that I think will be helpful or of interest to you. Here's this month's podcast feature. Hi, I'm Kate. And I'm Liz. And we host the Mom Deconstructed podcast. We interview moms to find out the real story of their mothering journey. Motherhood is the most difficult job there is, but unless we allow ourselves to create community and accept the help of others, it can be a very lonely endeavor. Let's get beyond the superficial, delve into the dreams that inspire us, the struggles that test us, and the conversations that connect us. You can listen to Mom Deconstructed anywhere you get your podcasts, from the Parents on Demand Network and at momdeconstructed.com. My two older ones are not living in apartments right now, but have during the college years, you know, where you kind of shift year to year. Um, And my older one lived in an apartment last year and she loves cooking for herself. And she actually became gluten sensitive in college. So she had to do the whole gluten free thing. And while she wasn't baking, it certainly opened up a whole new avenue for her in terms of having to find foods that she could make that were going to be things that she could tolerate, uh, which which a lot of them were not necessarily the foods we were eating on a regular basis or that she had already learned how to cook. 
And then my, my second one is living in an apartment situation right now. And she is a, she's a planner and she was just home for the, for the spring break. And she told me that she's rearranged, you know, her eating schedule. She, my kids don't tend to like the college um, cafeteria food either. I think that's a little bit to do with being raised by a dietitian mom because <laughs> she doesn't really care for that cafeteria food either. So she's got like a whole shopping list. She meal plans and she cooks four days, four days a week with a friend because they share the food bill that way. And she's, she's a former athlete. So she's, you know, really right now trying to figure out um, how to eat differently because when you're an athlete practicing three or four hours a day, you have a huge appetite and you can get away with eating lots of carb heavy foods. Um, so she's trying to learn how to change her eating a little bit. And I think I thought your book would be amazing for her because she loves to experiment in the kitchen. Yeah. And there's, uh, you know, there's tons of things in there that she, that would be great for a gluten sensitive diet and she could adapt where, you know, there's pasta and things like that. So I'm thinking about some of the listeners today and uh, there might be a little bit of a guilty pang for those parents who might have missed the boat on teaching their children or their teenagers how to cook. So what advice would you have for them? Well, I mean, I, I feel like it's such a big <laughs> responsibility raising kids. And first off, just to cut yourself some slack if you haven't gotten there yet with the cooking, um, because it's never too late. It's never too late to, to learn how to cook and to get your, your kids cooking. I actually wrote a blog post a while ago. It's called something like a playbook for getting teens and tweens to cook. Mm. And that has a lot of tips on sort of how to get this going. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think probably the first, the, the number one thing is to invite them into the kitchen and give them something to do. So yeah. if it's dinner time and they're, you know, chatting with you, just casually pass on a task. Um, whether it's like, Hey, can you toss this salad and just give them a few tips on how to do that? Or, um, Hey, can you take the potatoes out of the oven? You know, just little things like that as a starting point. Mm -hmm. In our house, you know, cooking has become a really, a really communal task. And, you know, that's something that's developed over time as they've gotten older. And one thing that has worked really well in our house is that we have a rule, and this rule applies to me too, which mm -hmm. is that if you cook dinner, you don't have to clean. Mm, I like that so rule. So <laughs> that has been a very effective tool for getting my teens and college students to want to cook because then they don't have to set the table, clear the table or do the dishes. Right. So, you know, every family is different and how the chores and things are set up, but that's something to think about. And I think, you know, having a book like prep can be a great jumping off point to get them cooking. I mean, give them the book, give them a set of sticky notes, ask them to mark the pages they're interested in, help them get the groceries in the house you know, carve out time to do this, all of that kind of stuff. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. it can be hard during the school year because kids are really busy with homework and sports and activities. So I also think the summertime is a really great time to, to kind of tackle this. Weekends too. If they're yeah. Around. And weekends. Yes. And it doesn't yeah. have to be dinner. It can be breakfast. It can be packing lunches. You know, it can be lots of things. When I love that rule, if you uh, cook, you don't have to clean. I, that used to be my husband and I's rule when the kids were really little, because I was like, I'm not doing the whole meal and cleaning up. So, <laughs> and some people prefer to clean up over cooking, but I think from a from a child standpoint or a young adult, teenager, college kid standpoint, they'd much rather cook. Most of them. Um, let's talk about college kids for a second, because they're a little bit unique in that. Some of them may want to start cooking or start experimenting with, with some of these recipes from prep, but they live in a dorm room or they're on a really tight budget. So what, you know, how can college kids who have that situation adapt some of your recipes in the dorm? I think it's, I mean, it is tricky in the dorm and it depends on the university. Obviously some, some like my daughter's college, they basically can't have anything electrical in their dorm rooms, but mm -hmm. I also know some dorms have communal kitchens. So there's a lot more flexibility and opportunity there. 
Right. Um, there is a chapter in the book called "Make How to Make Snacks and Little Meals. And those mm-hmm. are the types of things that they could certainly do. There's a really simple, you know, guacamole recipe. You know, it's like four ingredients. All you need is a bowl and a fork. There's a really simple little pizza that you can make. All you need is a toaster oven. It's three ingredients. I think smoothies are are great because if you either are allowed to have that in your dorm room or you have a communal kitchen, you you just need some milk and yogurt and some fruit and you've got a nourishing meal. Um, mm-hmm. So there are definitely some things that that they could make. And, and I think a lot of it is just building a little bit of confidence. So starting with small things like that and then building from there. And then there's, all, there's a, a chapter of, of different sweets. And I think that can be a really fun thing to do if you have a communal dorm kitchen is to make a big batch of, um, you know, I have a, a one bowl chocolate chip cookie recipe, really simple. Mm. And to have, you know, those smells coming down the hallway and then sharing them with your dorm mates is going to make you really popular. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with the boys. <laughs> mm-hmm. What about, you know, if you think about the foods that you wanted your own kids to learn how to cook before they left, were there there certain things that I know for myself, there were certain things I wanted to make sure they knew how to do. But um, I'm curious if you had certain things for your own children and even for all college kids or, or high schoolers leaving to go to college, recipes or just items that they really should know how to make before they leave the nest. Yeah. And that is that is exactly what this book is. And that that is the, those 10 skill sets or chapters that I talk about, I think that those really cover what I imagined or what I want for my own kids. So, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to mean that you know how to make everything in particular chapter. But for example, if you open to the egg chapter and you learn to make a pan of scrambled eggs, then you can build from that and you can then make an egg sandwich or you can throw some vegetables in there and then have a real meal. Or Mm -hmm. if you have, you know, if you can make just one pasta, there's a recipe in here called Genius Spaghetti and Tomato Sauce. It is very, very simple. And you make that, it's delicious. You can feed yourself, you can feed your buddies, and then you can build on it. And then maybe you put some ground beef in there at some point, or you maybe you put some leafy greens in there. So there's, I think that, I think knowing how to make a salad dressing and how to wash lettuce knowing how to cut up some vegetables and put them in the oven to roast, Um, not Mm -hmm. being intimidated to cook a piece of chicken or a hamburger. You know, these are the kinds of things I think of, really basic stuff that are kind of the foundation for lifelong cooking. Yeah, I think that that, I think you did a really good job of, of capitalizing on on those things. So do you mind just running through the 10 different chapters just so sure. people have an idea of, yeah. of what to expect? So prep eggs like a pro, make oatmeal, rice, and other grains, fix a killer plate of pasta, turn a pot of beans into a meal, build a better salad, cook vegetables you want to eat, cook meat, chicken, and fish, make snacks and little meals, feed your friends, and prep sweets to eat and share. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about Feed Your Friends. What's in there? Because I'm not sure I went through that chapter as as closely as the others. So I, I mean, as I said earlier, I feel like one of the best parts of knowing how to cook is being able to feed, you know, the people that you care about. So, and these are recipes that are really designed for that. They're all kind of one dish meals. So there's a baked mac and cheese, There's a sheet pan chicken and potatoes, really simple, homemade meatballs in tomato sauce. I wanted to have something vegetarian. This is actually, I think it's actually vegan, a Thai style coconut curry noodle soup. So if you are having friends over and someone happens to be vegetarian, that's a great dish Mm. for a crowd. And then there's a big pot of turkey chili. Can't go wrong with that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, um, so you said your kids helped you plan out this. What was that all like? How did that sort of transpire and how involved were they? They, I'm trying, my oldest was already in college when I, when I was actually writing the book, but you know, I'm home testing these recipes. So it's, it's getting them to taste them, 
sharing with them my proposed list of recipes and getting their mm-hmm. feedback. Like, do you think mm-hmm. a teenager would want to cook X? That kind of mm-hmm. thing. And then, you know, I was, it took me a while to get the voice that I wanted for this because all of my writing in the past has been for moms, really. You know, my blog mm-hmm. are almost entirely moms reading that. You know, the writing I do for magazines tend to be women. Mm-hmm. So I wanted this voice to be to young people without it sort of talking down to them. Mm -hmm. So I had my girls read what I wrote and tell me, you know, does this sound appropriate? And the one piece of advice, one of my daughters said, don't try to be funny, mom. Don't try to be (laughs) funny. And I thought that was actually a really good piece of advice. Yeah. So what are their favorite dishes? um, I think the feed your friends chapter is a really popular one. They love Mm -hmm. all those dishes. The, there's a golden banana bread that my youngest daughter is crazy about. The lemon garlic chicken thighs. That's a really popular one too. And then they love, this is a, a pasta that I made all while they were growing up. It's just called pasta with butter, egg, and cheese. Mm, I know and that recipe. <laughs> it's, it, you just, you cook the pasta in the, you, you finish the whole thing in the same pot that you cook the pasta in. So there's virtually no mess. And they all learn to cook that, you know, probably from the time they were like 10 on. That's mm-hmm. sort of their go-to. Um, so that is a, a real kind of family favorite. I know that recipe. I've, I've made that recipe of yours before, and uh, it's delicious. Thank you. I've also made the granola, the coconut. Um, I make that and I take it and share because I would eat way too much of it. <laughs> it's, it's kind <laughs> of <myself>. addictive. <laughs> so as we um, wrap up this conversation, if you think about what you want parents to know about helping their kids learn to cook, what really stands out for you? What's the burning? And and this probably ties into your why around what you do, what you do, why you write these books for kids and for parents and for families. What is it you want them to know about teaching their kids to cook? I think, I mean, a couple things. I, I think one of them is to kind of move out of the way a little bit to, mm. to make room for your kids in your kitchen. And I think this can be really hard. I mean, this is our territory, the kitchen. We've been running the show since they were before they were born. And we can get a little bit controlling around there. And I know I've been guilty of this, but we need to let them take over a little. We need to really tolerate some chaos because kids and teens in the kitchen makes messes it's so worth it in the long run. I mean, it's like so many aspects of parenting where it's all these steps along the way and you just kind of got to hang in there and it will pay off. I think just making room for your kids in the kitchen. And um, and that doesn't mean, you know, we can't set expectations about cleaning up, but kind of to chill out a little bit so that the cooking stays, you know, positive and playful. I like that a lot. Closing question for you. What does it mean to be nourished? That's a good one. Um, I think it's interesting because to me, it's really, I mean, I'm a dietitian. Healthy food is important to me, but it's really less about what's in the food. It's less about the vitamins and the minerals and the protein. I feel like if you're making homemade food, that's going to be kind of part of the package. So for Mm -hmm. me, it's more about, in a way, the emotional nourishment that comes with sitting around a table with, you know, the people you care about, whether it's you and your kids around a table, nourishing each other with your company and what you've cooked, or your kids in their first college apartment cooking a meal for their friends and then enjoying sort of that, the fruits of that labor. To me, that's, mm. that's real nourishment. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the soul mm-hmm. that comes from mm-hmm. being together and, mm-hmm. and the process. Yeah. So Katie, where can my listeners find you, find prep and your other cookbooks. And um, I also just want to mention that I will link to that article that you mentioned, a playbook for getting tweens and teens to cook. Cool. Just share with us how, how everybody can find you and, and find your cookbooks. So I'm, I have a blog. It's called Mom's Kitchen Handbook. So it's just momskitchenhandbook.com. And there is a link on there that will show all of my cookbooks with links for purchase. Um, Mm -hmm. But you can also buy prep and all of my books on amazon.com. I also know prep. I saw it on target 
uh, online, Barnes and Noble. And then certainly I'm a big fan of going to your local bookstore. Katie, thank you so much for coming on again. And we all, I'm sure myself and, and everybody here wishes you the best as this book launches. And we hope it gets in the hands of lots of teenagers and college kids. Okay, folks, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed having Katie's insight. I I really always enjoy talking to her, but we sort of are moving through the same similar phases in our children's lives. I actually have now a uh, graduate. By the time you hear this show, I will probably be heading up to my oldest's graduation from college, which is so wild and remarkable and wonderful and weird all, all at the same time. I'm so proud of her and excited for her next adventure, and as I am for, for all of my children, and I'm sure you are as well. Uh, but it is fun to hear Katie, her story behind what inspires her, and oftentimes what does inspire our creative juices are the things that we're going through right now in this very moment. So I hope you enjoyed that, and be sure if you have a graduate in your life, whether they be a high school graduate, a college graduate, this book will resonate and be a great resource uh, for those individuals, those young people who want to get started cooking for themselves and uh, learning how to cook. It's a great resource. Stay tuned for my next episode, number 84, where I speak with Maureen Healy, author of The Emotionally Healthy Child. Maureen, as I mentioned, will help us better understand why raising a child who can tap into and manage her emotions is the path to future happiness. The Nourish Child is here to help you feed and nourish your child, your family better. Nourish and nurture, one of the most important jobs you have as a parent. If this show speaks to you, be sure to subscribe to it. You can do it on Apple Podcasts or on one of your favorite Android apps. The Nourish Child is everywhere podcasts air. As always, thanks for joining me today. Tuning in means you're helping yourself. And when you help yourself, you help your child. And that's a beautiful thing. Be sure to give those graduates in your life a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.